hoping to leave you with uh, six key messages here. Um, uh, first, uh, if you look at the chemical industry over the last 20 years, the industry has outperformed broader equity markets in general. But if you start narrowing that space, what you'll see is that the industry has actually underperformed broader equity markets in the last uh, 10 years or so, uh, particularly so in the last three years. So there are multiple headwinds that the industry faces as, as we move uh, forward now. So that's a key message that we want to leave you with. Um, second, um, feedstock costs uh, are getting increasingly uh, challenging uh, right now. Um, if, you, if you look at the US chemical industry, the factors around feedstock competitiveness, especially the supply of natural gas liquids, continues to be very attractive. Uh, we have a great panel session after this that will get into that in a little bit more detail. But at the same time, I think uh, there are enough indications to suggest that this is not something to be taken granted for, and we'll talk about that uh, a little bit. Uh, in good news, um, the multiple megatrends that will create new markets for the chemical industry or will expand existing markets. Uh, mobility is, is one example. David talked about this a little bit. Uh, the 5G rollout, uh, infrastructure spending, which is expected to grow. Uh, and then it j just broadly speaking, a lot of innovation going on. And, and we just picked additive manufacturing as, as one example there, but the, we see a lot of innovation in a lot of other areas as well. Uh, fourth, um, you know, this focus on and, and desire of, within markets for customized, differentiated, specialized, uh, solutions to their needs, I think uh, that that will continue. What is interesting is that we are seeing that happening even in markets that we thought were fairly commoditized. And, and th that desire for customized, uh, differentiated products is, is much more pronounced today, even in markets that, that we thought were commoditized. So we'll talk about that a little bit. Uh, and the last two key messages, uh, we, we track the chemical and petrochemical uh, cap capital spending on a global basis every year, and, and we do see that picking up, but we see increasingly, uh, we, we see a lot more competition for, the, for those capital dollars, especially uh, competition coming from projects that might not necessarily yield a return. So a good example would be spent on decarbonization projects or uh, recycling projects. So I, I think those are a couple things that will uh, weigh in on capital spending uh, over the next um, uh, few years. Now, of course, if you zoom out and say, okay, let's look at the chemical industry for over the course of 20 years, you'll see that uh, the industry has outperformed broader uh, equity markets, but the, it's, it's getting increasingly challenging. Uh, we, we see two big reasons for this, right? And, and both of them, to a certain extent, have some uh, relationship with China. The, the first is that if you look at return on capital employed within the chemical industry, that has uh, been falling. Some of that is because broader utilization rates within the chemical industry have declined over the years. Uh, and, and some of that is because there's just a lot more capacity in China and, and therefore a lot more competition for these products. Um, second, what we see is that volume growth in the chemical industry has actually been declining. Uh, and, and some of that is related to this greater desire for specialty products, this greater desire for differentiated, customized products. But some of it is also because some of the large uh, consumers of these chemicals, China uh, is, is a good example, or other emerging economies like India, Brazil, uh, Russia, these economies have underperformed in the past decade or so. And, and as a result, it has been hard to kind of deliver the volume growth that the industry saw, for example, from 2000 to 2010. And that plays a factor in, in terms of depressing these uh, total shareholder returns. In other words, today the global industrial, the, the North American industrial enterprise is a lot more tied to natural gas than it was in the past. And the, the degrees of freedom that they have to move away for something to, for another fuel is, is far more limited. Uh, this is important because as natural gas prices rise, the only option that some of these segments have is to just shut capacity down. They don't have the ability to go and switch to another fuel, and, and that can have a pretty big impact on overall returns and, and, and the overall performance of uh, the chemical industry. Uh, 5G, um, you, you can see the, the chart on the right. We, we are essentially going to see uh, an order of magnitude growth in, in that market here. Uh, over the and, and that's that's in the near term over the next essentially f few years uh, through uh, 2025 
Um, this creates a significant opportunity for growth for polyimides, for PTFE-based uh, materials, for liquid crystal polymers. But because this market is growing so rapidly, it creates opportunities for competing materials to come and find potentially some space for these applications. What we see in markets that are growing very rapidly is customers are not too obsessed about you know, using the same material that they have been using for a very long period of time. They are more willing to kind of try other materials that will potentially give them an advantage in terms of cost, in terms of access to supply, in terms of speed to market. So that creates interesting niches for other competing uh, materials. So, so this is, I think, the emerging alternatives, the materials that we've listed in that emerging alternatives box. It's an interesting uh, area uh, to, to look at as, as this market kind of uh, evolves and grows. And the last piece I want to talk about is we address this a little bit here, but if you look at you know, traditional polyethylene markets, right, what we are finding is that uh, in, in some applications for uh, differentiated premium grades in polyethylene, uh, you know, we are seeing growth rates much higher than that of the traditional growth rate that you expect from uh, GDP, right? So if you look at polyethylene as, a, as, as an entire market that's growing at about three, three and a half percent, a little short of three and a half percent. But if you look at some of the uh, high uh, comonomer olefin content polymers, for example, we see that growing as high as 5% in some applications. Uh, and, and that is the interesting piece is that if you look at polyethylene and you dismiss that market as a commoditized space, we are actually seeing a lot of innovation that brings in uh, much higher growth rates. And, and we see the same thing. That's the comment that I was making earlier around uh, polypropylene, for example. So let's talk a little bit about broader sustainability issues, broader uh, challenges with um, uh, the, the chemical, petrochemical industry and, and how some of this uh, will, will kind of shake out. Um, so as I mentioned earlier, you know, we track capital spending in the chemical industry every year. And uh, obviously COVID has significantly slowed capital spending in, in the chemical industry. Uh, we expect that to start rising here uh, uh, over the next few years. But it's going to take a while before we start seeing the levels of capital spending that we saw pre-COVID. We think that it won't be until 2020, late 2024, maybe even 2025, before we'll kind of get to uh, pre-COVID levels in, in capital spending. Um, what is interesting is that there's more competition for these capital dollars now. Uh, and clearly recycling is, is one of them. We'll come uh, to, to decarbonization as well. Um, in, in the recycling space, right, I think a lot of the effort right now is on commercializing uh, some of these technologies. We, we have a couple of great speakers who will kind of talk about some of this here today. If you look at these companies and you look at, okay, what are the approaches that they are taking towards decarbonization? We see them essentially as four big uh, approaches, right? One of them is a uh, shift on feedstocks, right? You move to lower carbon intensity feedstocks. Uh, the second is you electrify your heaters and try to decarbonize your process to the extent uh, that you can. Um, third is you manage your molecules a lot more carefully, right? You don't let uh, anything go to waste and you try to squeeze as much value as you can. Um, and then finally, digital transformation, right? I uh, I, I personally am very skeptical about the role of digital transformation, but pretty much every single operator out there talks about digital transformation as, as a strategy to decarbonize. Uh, I think getting a good solid accounting of what is your emissions profile uh, and how is that segmented by each of the unit operations that you have in your assets, I think is worthwhile. And, and maybe that's where uh, a lot of the effort uh, might, might be worthwhile, but we are clearly seeing a lot of initiatives in and around uh, digital transformations as, as a way to decarbonize.